Hello traders, it's Saturday, May the 28th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give your FX market wrap-up for the past 24 hours and week of trading, as well as allow look for what we can expect in the trading week ahead. Now, this past 24 hours, or Friday session, uh, ended up generating a considerable amount of volatility. And, of course, uh, at the center of that volatility was one chairwoman, Janet Yellen, the head of the Federal Reserve. Her commentary was one of the top pieces of event risk alongside, I would argue, the G7's uh, official communique, although that didn't give us much in the way of tangible uh, influence, although I think its uh, economic impact is uh, actually quite significant if you know where to look. But Janet Yellen's remarks certainly weren't missed by the market. We ended up having a remarkable run from the U.S. dollar into the close, uh, as well as a interesting reaction from equities, which actually closed positive, although not with the same kind of gusto. The dollar's run has put me in a little bit of a quandary uh, because I was looking at a range of dollar-based pairs that I thought if there is a meaningful move from the dollar, either bullish or bearish, I have my scenarios, my preferred currency crosses that can offer me some uh, trading opportunity. However, this doesn't give me the clear kind of move that I was looking for, uh, especially uh, heading into a weekend. Now, amongst the dollar-based opportunities that I was looking for on a bullish side, the pound dollar was one of the top, and certainly there was a impressive uh, pullback. All right, it was only a two-day consecutive decline, but the pullback from the technical influence of resistance of 147.50, 148, which is a combination of the 200-day moving average as well as the uh, previous swing high that we had back in April, this is a particularly important level and from a fundamental perspective a strong dollar does particularly well here as it doesn't have a strong confliction uh, at least not until the next couple of weeks but I'm not confident in this being a range based move range is easier to actually accomplish hence why I like the pound dollar in particular a lot more than many other dollar based pairs which are requiring a uh, break to actually make uh, something tangible happen. So a path of least resistance makes cable that much more uh, remarkable in my book. But I don't really see that this dollar run is an innate follow through. If it were just the range that we're looking at here, that would be no problem. I might actually take a trade uh, on a range basis here and expect it to potentially fall back down towards the bottom of its range. But what is expected from the dollar is a break. And that's going to be difficult to carry through the weekend and on to, on to Monday, especially considering that we're going to have a something of a disruption in terms of, of uh, sentiment or speculative trend. And that's going to come because of the US-UK holiday. Now, of course, this doesn't take the entire world offline, but when we see this kind of uh, absence of speculative liquidity, it's very difficult to maintain momentum. All right, so it's going to be tough to fulfill a dollar break here and to fulfill it even in the terms of pushing a pound dollar back into its range. Now, if the dollar shows uh, that it's just going to go with it, I will uh, drop my concerns and probably reevaluate. Of course, entry is going to be consideration, but this has definitely kept me off of a trade into the weekend. Another one that had uh, more short term uh, am ambitions. All right, and this was certainly tactical in that it uh, relied better or, or more fully on immediate technical opportunities. The combination of the 100-day moving average that we have right here and this range low on this congestion was a nice confluence of opportunity. With a technical break, we could say, all right, well, we're moving back down towards the bottom of this range, uh, roughly 65. So that gives you approximately uh, 200 pips that you could potentially squeeze. But... On a technical basis, this is a break. Now we look at that same kind of break that you're expecting from the dollar, and this is reticent, so why would I not be reticent on the Kiwi USD? I am. And that was the lower boundary opportunities. Uh, they get all the way up into the high requirements, like the Euro USD, which is putting pressure on the bottom of this rising trend channel, and uh, more importantly, the 200 day moving average, which it closed above, I should, I should say, uh, above 111. This is going to require a serious level of conviction 
to simply continue into next week and clear the 200-day moving average as support. This I don't think is readily available. So this is certainly one that I would not uh, commit to uh, with the uh, problem of a dollar follow-through uh, leaving over to the week uh, to the new trading week. But I'm going to keep a close eye on these, especially the Euro USD around 111, that 200-day moving average, a break or a hold and reversal. If the dollar does commit to a, a clear run, uh, either bullish above 12,000 or bearish, uh, seeing a more substantive reversal of its uh, three-week, four-week rally, this is going to present a very good opportunity in terms of uh, scheduled event risk. So the tactical appeal is still there. While the U.S. markets are offline on Monday, things pick up very quickly into the week. The following active trading day, Tuesday, brings the Fed's favorite inflation figure, the PCE. I'll be watching that particularly closely. Uh, Wednesday, we get into Fed speak, we get into the ISM manufacturing report, even the OECD economic outlook. But it's uh, a Thursday comparison to other monetary policy, more Fed speak, and Friday's non-farm payrolls, one of the market's favorites, that really shows this as a uh, meaningful step-by-step -step influence and certain uh, catalyst of volatility reasons uh, or fundamental reasoning on multiple tiers. Right? It doesn't have to just be competitive monetary policy. Uh, it can also be a risk-oriented move. It can be a uh, tangible value of currency move. A lot of themes are going to be stirred because of the fundamental event risk that we have scheduled next week. So the dollar is going to be certainly uh, one of my top uh, interests in terms of uh, trading opportunity. Now, uh, I would also like to point out that, aside from the event risk in the dollar's inherent uh, technical positioning, the speculative exposure to the U.S. dollar is quite interesting. Uh, we follow on a daily basis the SSI, the retail traders' uh, positioning. But here is the futures traders' positioning, a little bit different in nature. Uh, it is slower, and the swings are more uh, time-extended. Uh, but you have a very big uh, capitulation in the short dollar view uh, in this recent upswing in the COT futures readings. There is a lot of, while it's not uh, heavily short, so to speak, the number of short exposure, individual exposure, not net, uh, is quite significant. And seeing a deleveraging of that can actually lead to a short squeeze that can actually lift the dollar beyond just a, a renewed wave of dollar bulls simply trying to take advantage of new data. So that is actually a uh, factor that can play into a number of markets, including oil and gold, for example. Now, another currency that uh, we've been tracking uh, pretty closely uh, is the yen. Now, the yen, my interest is uh, specifically uh, not a fundamental reflection of Japanese economy or Japanese uh, uh, financial health or anything along those lines. It's more of a reflection of risk trends. Risk trends and yen crosses go hand in hand. All right. Now, we did have some interesting developments in uh, Japan uh, this past week. Particularly, I was interested in the G7's official communique in which Prime Minister uh, Abe was actually looking for his colleagues to accept a uh, segment of rhetoric within their official uh, talking points in which they would say that financial conditions now are just as unstable and fragile as they had been back in uh, during the great financial crisis and that is a means to uh, for, well, it serves a number of purposes from Japan's perspective it means that it's uh, more of a free pass for them to respond to uh, unfavorable exchange rate moves uh, and uh, with uh, ext extraordinary monetary policy so very unfavorable otherwise uh, argumentative policy, policy that uh, would make other central banks, other leaders claim that they were manipulating their currency, they would pull back on it. But they did not agree to that. They did agree, however, that financial stability was uh, certainly of concern, that the risks to the future uh, global economy were rising, and uh, they listed a number of uh, issues that otherwise were uh, more repeats of what we've seen in the past. So there is a risk consideration here, and there's also less 
will to allow Japanese authorities to do whatever they want, uh, which in turn means they have less uh, uh, leeway to simply uh, intervene on behalf of the markets. This removes some of the threat that uh, any uh, strong move down in yen crosses will be met with an immediate response, even if ineffective, uh, still volatile inducing, uh, volatility inducing uh, response from the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance. Now this hasn't defined the dollar yen's trend, but I'm going to be watching this pretty closely because if the belief that the Bank of Japan as well as the ECB and other central banks, if their accommodative monetary policy in impact is going to continue to retreat, then I would suspect that there's going to be potentially a bigger move here uh, from the in crosses to the downside, and it would also lead to a greater capitulation risk appetite trends. Of course, we can also expect that uh, the Bank of Japan is going to be motivated to more interference and uh, could uh, encourage a lot more traders to get behind a BOJ uh, effort, even if it is lacking for influence. But I think the better catalyst is going to be risk-oriented uh, motivation. The problem is you see something like the S&P 500, even though it's higher than the DAX or the uh, Nikkei 225 or the FTSE, these, these exchanges or these indexes have more room to move to the upside uh, in historical terms. But the S&P 500 is a very profound leader of these uh, indexes. And that means that there is probably a very profound level of resistance to significant bullish runs. So if I'm looking for a risk-oriented move, I'm once again will be looking at tactical opportunities. ASEAN, which has more room to run within its range, and I did note in the Friday session that there is a ton of volume behind this. Uh, this could uh, intend uh, or uh, suggest a break is coming, but we'll see if that's going to be the case next week. This definitely requires risk appetite. I would also uh, point out Kiwi Yen and CAD Yen for similar opportunities, but the ASEAN is perhaps one of the best and most decisively positioned for a risk on. That I, though I'm not very uh, confident of a risk-on based move. Risk aversion is the greater risk. It has the greater potential to the downside if I'm looking at something like the S&P 500. Much more room down here before we get to serious questions of confidence. Uh, obviously we're already talking about serious questions of confidence where we're at to the upside. Dollar yen can be a good argument on both accounts but I have my long-term dollar yen short so I'm not going to be uh, taking any short-term swings just yet uh, to conflict with that long-term view, although I've definitely uh, toyed with the idea lately. Uh, the Euro-Yen is a better candidate. All right, you can see some tight consolidation here. My interests are certainly much more uh, long-term if risk aversion does start to uh, take up in a meaningful way. I've said the Euro Yen and the Kiwi Yen are two of my favorite places to uh, really put that idea into action. But there is some short-term interest uh, certainly building up here as well with this congestion. The Pound Yen is a better tactical opportunity from a short-term risk aversion view because you can see that it's uh, at its neckline, its inverse head and shoulders neckline. Seeing this slip a little bit is certainly within its capacity to do and pull back into a range, a path of least resistance type move, much like the pound dollar. Now aside from risk trends and dollar, which tend to be near the top of my list uh, uh, pretty regularly, I am going to keep a close eye on the pound Right, the pound Kiwi, pound Aussie, pound CAD. All right, this is actually a four-hour chart, so keep this one in mind. Uh, the arguments or the risks that I've stated with uh, the pound Kiwi, pound, uh, pound Aussie, as well as the much more attractive uh, pound dollar, all right, with that big ticket 200-day moving average up there, or the euro pound, very attractive from a technical perspective and the head and shoulders neckline break, is that they require follow through. Follow through that gets us into medium term trades and easily uh, cuts into Brexit fear. The lead up to Brexit is going to be quite uh, destabilizing. You're going to get a lot of volatility and it's going to be tough to generate conviction. So sticking out trends with pound based crosses is going to be more difficult to do. Now tactical opportunities are certainly more, uh, op uh, more reasonable. Pound CAD, I'm going to be watching, because it has more of that short-term view to it. This is actually a head and shoulders pattern on a four-hour chart, so a break below 190, if there's going to be a meaningful pound sell-off, is a reasonable uh, time frame, a reasonable uh, pattern to play out. 
A move back into the top towards the head could also be, but it has uh, more limited opportunity. Now in terms of scheduled event risk, the docket is pretty loaded, and we'll go chronologically. Monday is, once again, a holiday, but do not write off the event risk that we have throughout the day. Uh, that includes uh, Swedish and Greek GDP. Greek is uh, the second reading. Uh, you have uh, trade figures, first quarter for Canada. You have uh, a range of a uh, Japanese event risk and jobless uh, figures, industrial production, household spending. That's uh, obviously in a Tuesday's morning session. Then we get into a round of very important, individually, these are uh, pieces of event risk that can generate volatility for their specific currency. The systemic issues that I'm going to be watching, however, are the PCE in terms of what it does for interest rate forecasts for the Fed. Uh, I'll also be watching the Consumer Confidence Report because there is an important uh, wage growth expectation figure here. Wednesday, we get into Japanese, uh, cor and Jap uh, corporate Japan, uh, seeing their performance in terms of spending and profits for the first quarter. We have Australian GDP, much more important in terms of uh, leveraging Aussie movement, but also speaking to Asia's health. Uh, speaking of Asia's health, China's PMI figures, the official government figures, and the Caxon figures uh, will come across the wires. Uh, we will get into the OECD's economic outlook. I am in particular concerned about what's going to happen with the Brazilian first quarter GDP figures because this is not a small economy. This is actually the number eight economy in the world according to 2015 statistics for the CIA. Uh, this makes it a very crucial emerging market but also just a, an important player economically globally uh, and this will be on my radar certainly. Thursday is going to be the ECB rate decision is going to be an anchor as this reflects upon uh, the effectiveness of accommodative monetary policy which is under considerable debate across the world. Uh, and then, of course, on Friday, we have another round of PMI figures. You have Japanese earnings figures, which speak to the uh, bigger picture. Uh, we have Fed speak. Uh, but we also have uh, these two figures, uh, the employment figures from the U.S., but also the OPEC meeting. All right, the OPEC's uh, 169th Ordinary Meeting, which is going to talk about supply potential. Oil is still a crucial aspect. All right, and it has great implications for June. We're heading into a trading period of June. Uh, the markets inherently expect that June is quiet, uh, that there is little to be made in terms of return. Volume is expected to be low, and volatility is anticipated to continue to decline already at a significantly low level. Uh, June is actually the trough on average uh, VIX measures. But in reality, the risks are quite profound for a volatile June, much like June 2015 was actually quite volatile. All right. And the OPEC meeting and its implications for oil are one of the key factors that we have to consider. Now, I talk about June in aggregate as a very risky month and not the quiet one we presume from seasonality studies in the weekend strategy video, so I'll leave it to that video uh, to go into detail. But do be wary. There is certainly a lot of volatility still uh, staged in the market, and that means volatility as well as risk, so certainly stay aware of what you're dealing with. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We will do our next trading video next week. Until then, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and I wish you good luck trading out there.